coconut. Welcome aboard Science Station 2, where the corridors are filled with blue shirts and discussions of the hard and soft sciences can be heard from every corner. Welcome, listeners, to the first episode of Science Station 2. I am your host, Haley Stoddart. And today with me, I am very excited to have a special guest to discuss the topic. It is Dr. Ethan Siegel. Welcome aboard Science Station 2. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. You know, I I wasn't ready to take the teleporter, but I took the shuttlecraft over and it's great to be here. So thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to a fabulous discussion. I am so excited to have you on. Uh, We have talked before and you are a scientist. So I'm really excited because you have this topic that we're going to discuss and we can throw in some science into this discussion about where we're going, how we're going to get there. And we're going to kind of discuss this. How do we get to Star Trek? How do we get there? And what is it going to take for us, not only scientifically, technologically, um, socially, and philosophically? And so I'm really excited about this. You know, I, I am too. And I think you bring up just an excellent point just right off the bat is that when you think about Star Trek and where they are, you know, 200, 300, 400 years in the future. Uh, yeah, they have technology that is so advanced that it does literally uh, seem indistinguishable from magic to us, that you have them, you know, just materialize whole objects out of what appears to be nothingness. Uh, and then you have a permanent object that you can eat or you could play as a musical instrument or you could use as a as a tool like way beyond what any 3d printer can do uh you can travel faster than the speed of light you can communicate faster than the speed of light you right star trek has all of these things but what they also have is a lack of some of the major sources of conflict on earth today that they They don't have poverty. They don't have starvation. They don't have malnutrition. They don't have a world ravaged by diseases. Um, And so when you look at both how science has advanced and you look at like, oh, like, look at how everyone's life is better. But that that second part of it is huge because it's everyone's life is better. They, They don't have a homelessness population. They don't have an inequality problem although in in some incarnations of star trek they get into that and you do you know it's not like the original series or next generation where oh here we are on the flagship and everything is you know no like we're over here in the outskirts of the galaxy and we're cleaning up the mess of a civil war or you know oh we're in the middle of a another war with the klingons because you know it's you know fight 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 um so there are these interesting things and i think it's really worth looking at from a scientific perspective um, when it comes to hard physical sciences, but also from that sociological perspective, from that philosophical, like how do we need to evolve as individuals and as a society in order that, in order so that this dream, this vision of what the future can be can actually come to fruition. Yeah. And it's really interesting that, we get a lot of episodes in Star Trek where they're looking at encountering another planet and that planet is going through things that maybe today on Earth we would be going through. And so it's a nice reflection of like how far Starfleet and the Federation have come from those things and how far Earth has gone from those things to contrast it to a planet that they encounter that's got a civil war. We see that in Deep Space Nine. And so there's a lot of conflict, but it doesn't necessarily happen within Starfleet itself. Um, You know, the crew doesn't necessarily have conflict, which I don't think happens. I mean, it's still people and people have problems. There's unresolved conflict and issues within their own person that's going to affect their relationships with other crew members. Um, So we don't see a lot of that happen, but it's still going to be there. And so I, it's fascinating to take this look of like, okay, we can see some of these technological advances that have happened, 
you know, we have cell phones, we have laptops, we have computers, we have tablets. Um, but we're so far lacking in the social aspects and the soft sciences of advancing towards this future and, and what we need to do to get there. Um, and so that's, that's where we're kind of, I think, lacking the most in. You know, that's that's a really interesting point, because I when I talk to a lot of people about Star Trek, they they really want to know, like, OK, what do we need to have warp drive? What do we mm-hmm. need to have a transporter, to have artificial gravity, to have? That's what they think of is they think of the big technological advancements. And that's what they want. They want those conveniences to be part of their modern daily life. You know, they they. They want to have all the fun of alcohol, but they want to be able to sober up and not have the dead brain cells in the hangover. So so they want the synthahol. But at the same time that they think about things like that, you know, at the same time that we think about, oh, my, like with all of the uh, violence problems we have and with the policing issues that we have, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a phaser that we could set to stun and that we would not have these lethal encounters when non-lethal force with this technological advance uh, could do such a good job. And I, I, I agree with you that I guess the way I think about it is from Star Trek, if the Vulcans are out there and watching us and just waiting for that moment where human civilization as an enterprise has advanced far enough that they can make first contact, that we're ready for it, that it won't violate the prime directive of interfering with the development of a, um, let's call it a developing planet. Um, We... How do we do that? Are we ready for it? I mean, I I think it's really interesting to go back because uh, I, I was lucky enough with, when I was born in the 70s. I, I had all four of my grandparents still alive when I was born, and I, I got to know them. Three of them lived into old age, um, so I got to spend a lot of time with them. And this was the World War II generation. Um after both of my grandfathers fought in World War II, most of uh, most of the men of that era fought in World War II. The women all went to work and worked in whatever industries were around to work in. Uh, everyone pitched in to do that, and um, and we fought what at the time was basically like the greatest evil the world has ever seen. The uh, the Axis powers, the culmination of imperialism, the you know the genocide of huge numbers of people, just tens of millions of people, and. Uh, and, and we really tell this story to ourselves of the world came together to defeat evil like this. People of enormously different ideologies all joined together. And for a little while, it looked like planet Earth was sort of on the right track. That, you know, despite our differences, that we could understand each other, that we could work together for a common goal, and that it seemed like like nationalism might be on the way out where we could all sort of take a broader view. You know, we, we went to space. We saw the earth from space where there are no national borders. There are no colored lines on the map on, uh, of earth from space. Um, and so, you know, there was this hope that, that this would just be a steady progression towards creating the future that we want. And I think the, uh, the last few years and decades especially have shown us that this is not a slam dunk. You know, we, we hear things all the time about how the cost of freedom is constant vigilance and the, the price of freedom is that it's never more than one generation away from extinction. And, you know, I think we have to remember that any road that we've walked down, uh, that we can always choose our own path and say, this is the wrong road and it's time to turn around or it's time to take a detour or it's time to change course. Because I'm with you. I want to get to that utopian Star Trek future where, where all of these basically blights on our society and civilization that we have I'd like to see them improve. And I think 
I think maybe the best way to do this is, you know, I, this is going to sound a little judgy of me, but I'll own up to it is one of the ways that I judge people when I meet them um, is when at some point in a conversation, it comes up that some person or some group of people that they are not a part of that group is facing some kind of oppression, is facing some sort of social, political, economic difficulty in society. It could be because of the person's skin color, or it could be because of their upbringing, or it could be because of their country of origin, or their religion, or their gender, or sexual orientation, any of these things. And I do very much admit to when I see how any other person responds to a group that they're not a part of in distress, that, that is very much how I judge them. I, I look, is, is there compassion for what this person is facing, even if it's something you don't face? Is there um, this willingness to do something on their behalf, especially if they don't have the power to stand up for themselves the way that someone else could make a difference standing up for them. It's sort of that question that, that we, we deal with in Star Trek all the time of when do you get involved? To what extent do you get involved? And, and how do you get involved? When, when I first started watching Next Generation, you know, I was a young teenager and my favorite character at the time uh, was Will Riker because he was a lot of things that I wasn't. Um, he was, he was tall. He was conventionally attractive. He could be affable and sociable with a lot of people. Um, he, and, and he was always like, oh, like if there's a fight going on between this victimized person or culture and this oppressor, oppressor culture, he's always quick to jump in on behalf of the oppressed people. And as I got older, I started to like Will Riker less and less, and I started to like Jean Luc Picard more and more, because Picard would always have gone through, well, what are the consequences if I do this, right? If this Klingon vessel is getting attacked by this other Klingon vessel, and our friends are on this Klingon vessel that's getting attacked, what do we do? Yeah, Riker, Riker, or He'll he'll go open fire on the you know the enemies of our friends and and he'll do that. Picard is like you know what, I'm not going to start a civil war. I'm not going to start a, a war of the Federation with the Klingons when the Klingons are having their own civil war. I'm going to be more circumspect about it. And I, I think a lot of us when we come into a taxing situation when we, especially when we're new to it, we have that impulse that we want to act and we want to fix it. And we don't take the time to listen and learn about the nuances of these perspectives that we ourselves don't possess. So we're quick to judge and we're quick to anger and we're quick to make decisions about what's right and what's wrong without having all of the necessary information. And I think this idea of taking the time you need to draw the responsible conclusions, to figure out what's going on before you act, I, I feel like that is an art that we should be cultivating more. Um, and I think we've really seen that here on Earth play out over the course of the pandemic, that that people are just livid over that anyone could have not known the right answer about what's best, what all the evidence says all along. We, we still don't know a whole lot of things. There's so much we still need to learn because there are new things happening and new variants forming and the science is changing and growing and we're learning more of it. This impatience that we have of why aren't all of our problems fixed right now? They're just, if you just put me in charge, I could just fix all the problems. I know so many of us just think that, but 
but there has to be room to understand what are people's perspectives? What is at stake for them? Because it's difficult to come to a solution where everyone doesn't just get something they want, but everyone can look at this and say, you know what, this is what progress looks like. This is, this is us reckoning with the full gamut of whatever this situation is and finding ways to work together for the common good. That this is not just what's best for me and the things I care about, that this is this idea of what is good for civilization as a whole is also good for me. Um, and I sort of think about this in terms of, geez, isn't it, isn't it better when everyone is educated, when everyone is well fed, when everyone doesn't have head pain because they have tooth infections? Isn't it great where everyone can see and everyone can hear and everyone, you know, these are the things that that I would like to think we could all agree are are goods in the world that that knowing things and increasing people's happiness and comfort levels and security is a good thing and that decreasing uh, all of those levels of insecurity, housing insecurity, food insecurity, uh, health insecurity, um, if we can decrease those, this is like the rising tide that helps us not just as individuals, but to recognize that we're all part of the same enterprise, which is human civilization. And that when we move the needle forward in one way for all of us, it helps us all move forward together. Now, those are some really great points. So I want to ask you in this discussion, do you think as our We've talked about how the technology is kind of advancing faster than we are socially towards a Star Trek future. Do you think our technology advances will help us at some point? Do you think that the balance will kind of that the uh, degrees of separation between our technology advances and our social advances towards this future that we see in Star Trek? Do you think that gap will ever shrink? Do you that's think a, that, that's a good question? Right. That's a good question. <laughs> I um, mean, I think there's a point where everyone needs to realize that just because one person one person can't have all the good, right? Collectively, as you're saying, we need to collectively increase the positivity and health of everyone at the same time, rather than just certain populations or certain groups. But do you think that gap will ever decrease? I mean, that that is a good question. The reason I say that's a good question is because it makes me think of, you know, it, it could go either way, right? Mm -hmm. The gap could not close, the gap could even widen, or the gap could close substantially. And that all to me depends on who gets access to enjoy the fruits of these technologies. You know, we have... Uh, a large number, I think it's hundreds of thousands of kids a year uh, go blind because of vitamin A deficiency. We have basically the cure for this type of blindness, which is to say uh, we have genetically engineered a type of rice, uh, it's called golden rice, that if these populations, which rice is a huge part of their diet, if they changed the rice they're using now for golden rice, uh, no one would have a vitamin A deficiency. That you could just grow this other type of rice instead of this type of rice. You would get all the vitamin A that you need, and then hundreds of thousands of kids wouldn't go blind. But a few years ago, uh, there was this enormous effort to grow gold golden rice and um, I guess I would call it an act of eco-terrorism. Uh, people were afraid that these genetically engineered golden rice organisms uh, were going to do all sorts of things that, that they don't do. But that it, what they specifically thought it was going to do isn't important. What's important is that they destroyed it and ensured that this blindness plague would continue for years and years because they burned all the golden rice. 
um, because they were afraid of it. Um, now, I'm not saying that everything that happens happens for a reason similar to that, right? There are all sorts of reasons why people don't get access to the latest technological advances, to the latest developments. There are a lot of fears over 5G, for example, that are wholly unfounded. But I have a feeling that when people are like, well, I could either get the new phone that's 10 times faster than the old phone, or I can sit on my old phone like it's a dial-up modem, I'm probably going to get the new phone and I'll discover that my 5G fears were unfounded. Not everything is that simple, right? We, we still have... Uh, countries like Ethiopia and Eritrea that, you know, at, at best, I would say, have a ceasefire between them. But I think 20% of the Eritrean adults at any given time are on active military duty on the Eritrea-Ethiopia border. That's, that's a pretty big crisis. You know, we have, you know... We have a risk of an enormous number of people dying in a country like India right now uh, as a result of the pandemic. And still we have so much misinformation circling about that, that people, I guess, are so invested in, in terms of their identity, that things be a certain way, that they're not willing to change even when the evidence changes. I don't know that there's a cure for that. But I do know that if we can say, you know what, here are the benefits of what we've developed. Here are the benefits of what we've learned. And here's all of these things. And we are going to undertake a collective effort to make sure that everyone who can benefit from these advances reaps the benefits of those advances. I think that's how we get there. That's how we build, you know, the the Star Trek type future that we want is we say, you know, well, this doesn't mean that, you know, health care is going to be really good for the people who can afford it and not for anyone else. It doesn't mean like, well, you know, the people who are the most successful uh, they get to go to Mars, they get to own all the land, they get to profit every time, you know someone else labors and that increases inequality you know i i think if we can just make it a practice to put ourselves as best as we can into the shoes of people whose shoes we've never walked in if we can do what we can to empathize with the challenges they're facing the same way you would if a friend or family member had an illness physical or mental that you didn't have the same way it would if a if a child or a parent uh, was facing a difficulty that that you never encountered in your life but that you but that you saw they were suffering like if we can care about one another and extend that compassion to one another I think that's that's how we get there. You know, I, I don't want, I don't want to get, you know, 20 vaccines to make sure I'm safe from coronavirus. I, I'd do it. I'd take all the vaccines. Give me Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson and Johnson, AstraZeneca. Give me all of them. I'll take all the different immunities combined. Thank you. But what we want is we want the people who need those vaccines to get them. I still optimistically look towards a world where the diseases that can be eradicated through technology and good behavior, I still believe in a world where we do it, where we eradicate these diseases, or at least we eradicate these diseases in humans. I'm all for a world where by collectively working towards a common good, a common social good, a common health good, a common economic good. Uh, we can be that rising tide that lifts all boats. We can, we can make that happen, but, but everything depends on that. You know, if, if we develop all of the, this great, you know, rocketry technology and we can take Elon Musk and, you know, his 1,000 favorite uh, multimillionaires to Mars, that's not really going to benefit humanity the same way 
that solving the carbon crisis would benefit humanity. It's not going to benefit humanity the same way that ending world hunger would benefit humanity, or for that matter, eradicating coronaviruses would benefit humanity. So I think when you're asking about how do we do that, how do we get there, we have to start thinking not of ourselves as individuals that are separate from the whole of human society, but as people who are inextricably tied to the human enterprise. Uh, and if, you know, if, if I succeed and you fail, that means we both fail. I think that mindset is something that we, we don't even just need to embrace it. We have to understand that this is reality, that if that equality for me and not for you is not equality. Exactly. And that's, that's something I think that is huge. And, and right now we don't have that. And I think that's going to be one of the key factors, if almost not the key factor to getting to this idea of Star Trek. Outside of the technology, we have to understand that just because I have something doesn't mean that it takes away from you. And just because you have something doesn't mean it takes away from me, but we need to be equal and we need to have this compassion and sympathy, which is something I've been seeing lacking. And one thing I think that really helps foster that is active listening. And you'd, you'd said something earlier and I didn't want to pipe in, but I feel like so many people listen, but they listen to respond rather than to listen to understand. And we're so reactionary at this point in time and we're selfish. We all are. Some people are more so than others, but I think collectively and globally, so many people say, well, me, me, me. I'm more important than anybody else. I'm more important than anything else. And until we reach a point where we understand that everybody has to grow together or no one grows together at all, we're not going to get there. Even if the technology advances, I think that gap will increase, stay the same. And only the people who can really afford to go out into space will go out into space and we'll still have this class system that we have in it's here in the U S I'm definitely lower middle class. That's for sure. And I know that until we close those gaps, we're not ever going to really get there, which is really sad because we want to get there. That's, I mean, yes, Star Trek still has its problems, but I think there's so much good right there that we can see. And if other people could understand that, if other people could see that, hey, if we all collectively rise together, isn't that better than someone rising up higher than somebody else? But there's so many motives in humans and so many people are not completely altruistic that I don't know if we'll ever get to that point unless some of these negative aspects, people really don't focus on them and turn inward and look at themselves and say, okay, what am I doing that's not helpful? What am I doing that's a negative thing? What am I doing to keep others down? It's not going to happen. You know, I, I liked a number of things that you said there. I liked what you said about listening because there are a lot of people who listen in the sense that they're waiting to talk. They mm -hmm. have something they want to say and that's all they do is they, sure, you can say what you say, but it's not like I'm paying attention to you and what you're saying. I really just have my own point that I want to make. I feel like this is really exemplified by the political discourse we have, not just in the United States, but around the world that that people just have their own set of talking points and they harp on those. And, you know, you see that people on Fox News versus people on MSNBC, they're, they're not even talking about the same issues. They're not even in the same reality. They're, you know, they're talking about whatever, whatever it is they've decided the news should be, but it isn't actually about the events that are occurring in the world and affecting people's lives. And that's, 
that that's I think very detrimental because that's that's something that stokes divisiveness in us. Mm-hmm. You know, we can we can always do that. We could say, oh well, we 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 you and I we we live in different states and we have different ethnicities and we have uh, different uh, you know experiences. Maybe we have different education or economic backgrounds. Like we we could we could try to divide ourselves in all these different ways, but we can also look at what we have in common. We can also look at, you know, we're both human beings. We live on earth at the same time. We, we see the world that has the same issues. What can we do to help? What can we do to help make things just a little bit better than they were before we came along onto the scene? And I think I don't want to lambast self-interest because I think it's important that we act in our own self-interest. I, I'm a big fan of telling people, um, and this is a lesson I think I had to learn that, uh, if you want other people to stand up for you, you have to also be willing to stand up for yourself, that you, you are worth standing up for and by standing up for yourself, you show other people that you are worth standing up for. Um, and I think, I think that's an important lesson to learn. So I'm not against self-interest, but like everything, uh, it's possible to have too much self-interest. It's possible to have self-interest or ambition or whatever it is that, that actively it actively harms the rest of society. It actively harms those around you. Just like if, uh, I don't know, if you have your family and you've got to get dinner for your family and you go out and you pick up dinner for your family and you eat everyone's dinner because you're hungry, you haven't fed your family. You did something in your own self-interest that was to the detriment of everyone else. And, you know, I, I say that and people think like, oh, well, that's absurd. No one would ever do that. But, but I feel like people do that every time they, every time they choose to go out and blow their budget on alcohol instead of buying what you need and paying your bills. I feel like people do that every time they, you know, they lie to their spouse about where they are and they just don't. They don't tell them the truth because they're ashamed of it or they want to get away with something or whatever it is. But, you know, I I feel like there's always going to be that element to people, that selfishness, that here's what I want and I want to get it and I'm going to go get it regardless of who else is involved with it. But I think that if we can recognize, if we can even just say out loud, to ourselves and to each other that, you know what, things will get better for all of us if we collectively act in the best interest of all of us. I might be afraid of getting a vaccine, but if I go out and get the vaccine because it makes everyone safer, then I should do it. If you need to make a rule where, you know what, Ethan, if you don't get that vaccine, you you can't participate in these public activities. Uh, You can't go to public school. You can't send your kids to public school. You can't go to the DMV because it's not a safe place to be. You can't like, this is, this is what we do. We, I'm still not a fan of telling people how they have to live because I'm not a fan of telling people there's one right way to do things. But I, at the same time, I am a fan of saying, you know what? We don't like to force people to do things. We've decided that that is like fascism. You can't make people do things, but you sure can give them incentives to do it. And you sure can give them disincentives against not doing it. I mean, they, we we don't have a federal law that says you have to be 21 years old to drink in the United States. But when I was in high school, uh, Louisiana was the last state where the drinking age was 18. And uh, I, I, I even knew some people who would make the long drive down there 
to get alcohol and drive back because they were allowed to do it. I think it was when Clinton was president, uh, what he did was he tied highway funding, federal highway funding to compliance with your state's drinking age should be this. Um, and Louisiana was like, well, we need highway money. We, we need to maintain the in, interstate infrastructure system. So we want that money. We'll raise the drinking age to 21. That was it. No one, no one legally challenged that or anything. I think if you, if you want people to engage in the behavior you want them to engage in, you need good leadership. And that starts in a number of different places, but it starts from people demanding that this is the type of leadership that we want. You know, we, we are a representative democracy here. We can, we can choose who represents us. It's, it's very difficult to, to do that when you're up against, you know, large, large sums of money and power and influence. But, um, but I'm not ready to give up hope yet. I think that when we think about, you know, all of the th changes we have been able to affect, all of the ways that our world has improved, even, even over my lifetime, I remember, you know, what life was like in the early 1980s versus now 40 years later in the early 2020s. I, I, I think most of us have it pretty good in a lot of ways, but I think we're also keenly aware of the ways we don't have it good and that people around us don't have it good. And, you know, another thing you were saying, I would just encourage people to be compassionate towards one another. I, I have a lot of negative interactions with people these days because someone will come into a situation and they will I don't know what's happened to them. I don't know what their life has been like over the last year. I don't know how many people they've lost. I don't know how many illnesses or injuries they've suffered. I don't know what sort of mental health uh, issues they're having. I don't know what family difficulties they're having. I don't know what financial difficulties they're having, but I'm sure they're there. I have some of those difficulties. I'm sure you have some of those difficulties. I'm sure most of us have some or all of those difficulties to some extent. I think it goes so far to just recognize the humanity of other people, to recognize that is everyone doing their best? No, but a lot of people are. They're doing the best they can with the energy and the resources they have at their disposal. It's not always enough. It's not always adequate, but this is what people have to work with. And when it's not enough for them to cope with what needs to be coped with or to reckon with what needs to be reckoned with, can we offer them compassion and support instead of lambasting them that they didn't do the thing we wanted from them? And I think as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start viewing people as people with similar struggles and difficulties to your own, with these human struggles and difficulties that they have, it suddenly becomes much, much harder. I would say it even becomes appalling to treat them like they aren't worth every bit as much as you are. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. It's, you know, I, I work in mental health and we meet our clients where they're at. And I think that's the thing a lot of, that's the other thing I think a lot of people need to understand is meeting others where they're at, not where you are, not where you expect them to be, but where they're at. And that lends you to being open to understanding and open to listen to where they're at and help in whatever way you can. And so I think that's something that, you know, in all of this, that's going to help us get there. And that's missing in a lot of people. And this understanding and saying, okay, I'll meet you where you are. Let me, let me come down to you and that's okay. 
it's okay to come down to somebody else's level. It doesn't mean that you are there, but it just means that's where you're meeting them. And that's a big thing. It's a big thing in recovery is meeting people where they're at. And so, gosh, it's interesting to take a look at all this because there's so many ways that we are so far from getting to anywhere near this utopia of Star Trek. And, you know, there's so many different steps to take to get there, I think, emotionally, socially, economically. I I mean, you know, money. Money's a big thing. There's no money in Star Trek. And and how do we get to that point where money isn't a driving factor? Because I think that is a big thing in a lot of things that is keeping us from advancing and having that gap close in between the technology and everything else to get to this is because money is such a big thing. You know, you you mentioned, oh, this person has more money, so they're going to get more influence politically. But if we took that away and take that out of the equation, maybe the person who should be, who's going to help these advances that we need socially and economically, maybe they would win. Maybe they would get into those positions. You know, I, I look at my state. It's a very Republican state. There's a few Democrats spattered here and there that get elected. But locally, there's not even Democrats that run because there's no point for them to mm-hmm. waste their money. Yeah, you yeah know? there are a lot of and, places, a lot of particularly rural areas, and mm-hmm. I, I, I know them where... Uh, where the D stands for defeat. If you have a D next to your name, it's obviously like you, you don't have a chance. I, I always had thought that, you know, when I was young, that you could run as anything and people would judge you based on your merits. And, you know, of course, that's <laughs> a extremely naive attitude to have, but it's just amazing to me how much weight we put behind our own opinions about things. And once, once we've decided what our opinions are, uh, so many of us are resistant to changing that, that if we hear any evidence that appears to support our view, we're going to remember that and we're going to take that in. We're going to use that to bolster what we think. And if we hear anything that conflicts with what we think, uh, we're going to find ways to discount it and poke holes in it and say like, oh, but this isn't important. And I think part of what needs to be this culture shift in making Star Trek's future uh, closer to reality is we need to value the act of learning and changing your mind based on new evidence higher than being right all along or never having had to say I was wrong. Mm. Because we are wrong all the time. I don't care who you are listening to this. I don't care if you're Einstein. I don't care if you're Elon Musk. I don't care if you're my dad. You are going to be wrong. Sometimes you are wrong. Sometimes you do not have enough information to make an informed decision. And then later that information becomes known. Or sometimes the information was always known, but it wasn't known to you. Or sometimes... um new evidence just got discovered or sometimes it got reinterpreted in this new context. And now we realize, well, we thought it was this way, but now it's the other way. Imagine being so stuck in your own thoughts that, you know, you were like, Oh, look, I thought if I mixed ammonia and bleach, I'd get extra clean clothes. But I learned if I mix ammonia and bleach, I make it terrible noxious mess that can kill me and everyone in my house so what do i do well i can either say oh ammonia has good cleaning power and bleach has good cleaning power and i'll just make them call the fire department every two weeks when it's time to clean those things up or i can learn ooh I should never mix ammonia and bleach and i should teach everyone to never mix ammonia and bleach And there are other ways to get things clean that don't involve mixing ammonia and bleach. Don't mix ammonia and bleach, (laughs) listeners. (laughs) So 
I guess one thing I, I have to ask is I've got a kid in school and I, I like you, I am a bit younger than you, but I grew up in the eighties and the nineties and this deductive reasoning and this thinking for yourself. I remember it was a big thing, like write your own papers, have your own thoughts. And granted, we didn't really have the internet. I mean, I did all my research papers based off going to the library in the card catalog and looking up things in, you know, the Britannica, <laughs> Encyclopedia Britannica, you know. So do you think that I, I'm a big fan of education. I'm a big fan of extending your education, getting some college, even if it's not your thing, doing something, trade school, something, but this deductive reasoning and really critical thinking, do you feel that that has kind of declined with people in general or certain generations just aren't taking a look at things? Because that is a big thing. If we cannot say, here's apple and here's an orange and and make those conclusions based off of which one is going to be the better thing, which has the consequences that are going to be better for me versus all these negative ones. Do you think that's something that is lacking that could lend us to get to this place where we could get to Star Trek? If people you know, can't critically think about different topics and make a choice off of that. It's it's a very tough thing because I don't I don't think I have this attitude that I think things were better 20, 40, 60 years ago and they're worse now. No. Yeah. I just think that people are kind of the same as how they've always been. And, you know, instead of kings or nobles, we have billionaires. And instead of, you know, Whigs and Democratic Republicans, we have Democrats and Republicans. But we, you know, oh, most things haven't really changed. Most people, and, and we do this too, I do this too, uh, we take intellectual shortcuts. We don't have the time or energy to examine everything in gory detail. But the big thing that I would like to see return is this valuation rather than a devaluation of expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you asked me to be on your podcast because like, oh, well, Ethan's like an expert on Star Trek technology and he has a PhD in astrophysics and he wrote that book that I like. And, you know, and, and yeah, I, I have those things. I have those areas where I'm an expert in that. Uh, but even in those fields, I have to be learning new things. You know, I, I was talking to someone just a few days ago about how, well, when the Milky Way and Andromeda merge, what type of galaxy are we going to wind up with? And 20 years ago, she wrote a paper telling everyone, oh, it's going to make an elliptical galaxy. And of course it will. And I asked her about it. And she's like, mm, it's very unlikely we're going to make an elliptical galaxy. Actually, we're probably going to be some sort of distorted spiral uh, that'll probably settle down and still have a disk and still have arms and still have gas. And it won't be an elliptical after all. What's changed? Well, we learn more things. We learn more information. We made new observations. We took new measurements. We improved our simulations. And we learned some things that were counter to what we expected. You need an expert to do that. You can't know that without the expertise. So if you don't have the expertise, you could go do your homework and you could find out what the majority of experts on the bleeding edge of the field are saying now, but that's a lot of hard work, especially if you don't have that expertise, it's much, much easier to say, okay, who are the experts? Who should I ask? Where should I go to get this information? I'm going to do as much homework as I can. You know, just like if I had a medical problem, I'd want to do all the homework I could on it. But when I go to the doctor, and the doctor sends me to the specialist and I go to the specialist, I don't want to sit there and tell the specialist what I learned by searching this and by reading PubMed. And no, I want to, I want to tell this expert my experience in my body and I want them to tell me 
what I should be doing about it and why. I want them to synthesize something together for me to the best of their abilities because I know that what they've trained themselves to do, the hard work they put in all those years of study, that's not worth nothing. That's not just, well, my opinion is just as good as your facts or your knowledge. No, I don't go to the doctor and tell them how to be a medical doctor. I don't go to the mechanic and tell them how to fix my car. I don't go to uh, I don't go to a world-class painter and pull out my fingers and say, look, I know how to paint too. I, I don't do that the same way I don't really appreciate it when, you know, someone without a degree in physics comes to me and tells me like, oh, do you want to hear my theory of the universe? Do you want me to tell you why Einstein is wrong and Heisenberg is wrong? And all? like, I, I bet you I don't. I bet you I don't want you to tell me that. Not because you don't have interesting thoughts, but because there probably isn't something that has a merited value to it there. You probably don't have something that I or no one else has ever thought of before that is just brilliant and novel. It's probably not the case. And it's probably not the case. Oh, geez. Like we have lots of flaws as humans in our thinking. Like we are way more likely to believe a fantastic and unlikely explanation than uh, just a small little lie. Like if I told you that, oh, you know that they, uh, they've genetically engineered green cows now. And you're like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they basically took a plant and they spliced its genes into a cow and there are now chloroplasts in cow cells, they can absorb sunlight and they can photosynthesize some of their energy. Uh, and when they eat grass, uh, that this actually helps them because it increases the green color so their uh, chloroplasts become more active. I mean, doesn't this sound great? E Ethan's obviously lying, right? Like he's <laughs> gotta be lying. Uh, and they've genetically engineered a cat to glow in the dark, but that's not the same. No, I, I am lying. I did make that one up. but. That's the sort of story that if I told it convincingly enough, there would be some people who say, wow, really? Uh, just like uh, 25 years ago, I remember someone telling me that, well, you know, there's this DNA evidence in the case, but I think that means OJ's son did it, that his son wanted to get his father out of the marriage and he went and murdered his his father's ex-wife and her new lover and that's what uh and that's what really happened that oj didn't kill it but he took the fall to cover up for his son and i you know and i, I listen to this and i'm like this person first off doesn't know how dna works but second off even if they did know how dna works it was such a compelling lie to them where they felt these pieces were sliding into place um a lot of people just can't accept that no one's in control of what's going on in the world, um, that, that there is no puppet master behind the strings, that the world is just a violent and chaotic place where people are lashing out and doing things illogically. People do not always act rationally. And I think we need to, we need to accept that and, and we need to not reject people because they have behaved or are behaving irrationally, but we need to show them that there is a path towards doing it right. And you need to model that behavior of here's how you do it right. And like you said earlier, uh, that starts with treating them with respect and compassion and showing them that regardless of what your differences are or how your differences manifest that we can work together to build a better life, a better community, a better world for all of us to live in. No, I, I definitely agree. I think this is something that, do you think it would be better started at locally, like small little communities and have it spread or does it need to start larger than that? You know, this idea of treating people with compassion and understanding where they're coming from and creating these 
disparities, decreasing these disparities between people. How do we, how do we do that? You know, I, I think there are positives towards any approach. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you can get one person to act in a positive way, regardless of what that way is, you've done something good. But this is the sort of thing where I think, you know, whether I talk about the people in your little town in Idaho, or whether I talked about, like we spoke about earlier, about the people living in Eritrea, like, I think it's very important to recognize the humanity in one another, even in those of us who look different or believe different than we ourselves do. And I think it's important to put your effort where you will feel like it isn't being wasted. If you feel you, where you can make a difference is at the national or international level, put your efforts there. If you feel like where you can make a difference is at your local level, put your efforts there. None of it is bad. This is, this is something I used to struggle with a lot when I was younger is like, there are all these different causes that I feel are positive and that I'm passionate about. And I don't have the time or energy or money to further most of them. Honestly, I can really only pick a small number of things where I can make a difference. The important thing is to do them, whatever they are. Um, if Bill Gates is passionate about ending illnesses and uh, creating vaccines and uh, eradicating diseases. Yeah, I mean, if I had Bill Gates money, would that be the number one thing I would focus on? I don't know. I doubt it. But I'm not going to say Bill Gates is a bad person because he's spending his money on doing a good thing in the world that isn't the thing I would choose. We, I think it's very important that we honor the efforts that we spend trying to improve the world around us. I don't think everyone even needs to be altruistic. You just need to do something that you recognize is positive and is going to impact others positively where you are or where you're not like just that it's going to positively impact others. That's something all of us can do. We, we can't all do it to the extent we would like. We can't all do it, you know, at the level we would like or with the intensity we would like. But anytime you do something good, especially if it's something good that is going to impact others or the natural world, you know, I, I think, even if it only helps one person, you can know you did something good helping even one person. I don't know what the best solution is because this is a, this is too big a problem for mm -hmm. one person to solve. It's probably too big a problem for one generation of people to solve. But if we can build a world where people are freer from oppression and suffering and disease and illness and crime and violence and war and food insecurity and all of these other things that are just blights on our existence here, I think we should always, always celebrate that progress, no matter how small it is. It doesn't mean you should rest on your laurels of that progress, but it's important to take time out to appreciate even the small steps that move things forward. Yeah, definitely. And in this discussion, you know, I was sitting here thinking about as you're talking, it's really that Star Trek basically made it so every single person had their base needs, those Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those ones that are super important for you to advance in anything else to move beyond yourself are met. Their physical needs are met and their psychological needs are met because no one's worried so much about being feeling insecure, unsafe because of, you know, war is gone. I mean, I'm not saying conflict is gone in Star Trek. There's still conflict. And we didn't see Earth a lot 
in Star Trek. I mean, they come and they visit and they go to Starfleet or the Daystrom Institute, but they don't see Earth. But we can extrapolate that that is not an issue anymore. Once we get past what we see in Deep Space Nine with the Bell Riots and, you know, the Third World War and that kind of stuff. But it's very much that these base needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, are met. And we know now that even if someone has those met, they can grow and flourish and thrive well beyond what they thought their expectations of themselves were. But until those base needs are met, which is housing, it's food, it's illness, it's economics, once those are taken care of and filled secure and filled, people thrive and grow. So I think that's something that we're going to have to get to, not just locally where we live in our towns and our counties, states, countries, globally, we have to get to this place where everyone's base needs are met and kept so that people can flourish and thrive. And then maybe that gap would close a little bit. I I, I think that's an outstanding plan. I mean, if if we realized how little we would actually have to invest in global infrastructure in order to make sure everyone has enough food, make mm-hmm. sure everyone has enough water, make sure everyone has enough medicine, make sure like has the right medicine. You know, these, these are basic, basic needs and they are needs that a lot of people do not have met. Uh, both in this country and also across the world. But at the same time, I believe a greater percentage of people are having those needs met. And there's still hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people who don't have those needs met. And I don't mean to like marginalize their plight. But if the goal is to make sure everyone has those needs met, then as we progress towards that goal, we should learn the lessons of what works, what's effective, what's reaching these people, and what, where are things falling through the cracks, who still isn't being served, and how do we get there? Because you're right, you know, one of the ways this was really brought home for me is my first job out of college, I was a public school teacher. And I had a number of kids in that school who could not focus in class, just would not pay attention, would not focus because some of their basic needs were not being met. I had one kid who was in excruciating pain all day because the kid had never been to the dentist and the kid had a toothache and you cannot expect to pay attention in school if you are in constant unmanaged pain. You know, and so this is the sort of thing that honestly, if you would spend like two or three hundred dollars to get that kid's tooth problem fixed and just get them toothbrushes and toothpaste and dental floss and some really basic things, that kid would have a chance in a way that they didn't have a chance because they didn't know what it was like to go through life without that excruciating pain in everything they did. It's We have this attitude that I see play out as someone who is experiencing an unfairness will complain, this isn't fair. And the response that I overwhelmingly hear that person receive is, well, life's not fair. And I don't look at that as a solution. Like that's a statement of fact, but it also doesn't do anything towards solving the problem. What would go a huge way towards solving that problem is asking the person who's experiencing the unfairness, well, what can we do to make it fair? What can we do to increase the level of fairness for other people who are coming up and facing the same adversities? If we can start to conceptualize, you know, we see these problems and, yep, like if we start to ask, what can we do about it? What can we effectively do about it? How do we do that? Right. That 
that to me speaks to the difference between something being a dream, which is what I would currently say is having that utopian Star Trek future be that that is it's a dream. If we can transform that dream into a goal, the only thing that separates a dream from a goal is steps, is plans and steps to make that happen. So I think when you're like, well, what can we do in our local communities is take a step, identify something good you can do and take a step. What can we do in the national discourse? Take a step. What can we do showing compassion to others, including those who aren't being compassionate in the first place? That can be a big deal. That can be a very big deal. So you know, it's kind of funny that we've had this whole conversation and I feel like of all the podcasts I've been on recently, I've probably talked less science on this one than than any others. But I think that that it really is sort of interesting to approach this from a humanity perspective, because a big way we get to where we want to be as a society is to recognize the value and humanity inherent in each and every one of us. Then when we start looking at this as this is not a this is not an Ethan enterprise or a Haley enterprise or a me and my family or me and my town or me and my state or me and my nation that this is this is the human enterprise that this is the relationship between our species our planet and our universe the stakes seem so much larger than if it's just us so i think I think it's important to not lose that sense of largeness, to not lose that sense of awe and wonder, and to remember how short an amount of time we're all here for. And that, for me, really uh, makes clear how important it is to do good with the time that we have while we're here. No, I, I would agree with you. Thank you, Ethan. And I appreciate that. This is been such a really fun discussion. Like I said, this, this isn't just about the hard science. This, this podcast is about the soft sciences because those are just as important in Star Trek, even though we don't always see them a lot as the hard science, as the technology, because we have to have both. We have to have the technology to get us there. But if we don't advance ourselves socially, economically, emotionally, then we'll never get there because we will be too focused on the chaos around us and not fixing anything that's broken to really be able to use that technology beyond the billionaires who can, oh, whatever, I'm just going to go kind of thing because I can. And that doesn't take us globally anywhere. That just, just leads us down more path of destruction where we won't ever get there, which would be really sad, in yeah, my opinion. I, I, I mean, I, I obviously agree with you, but I, I think Star Trek did a wonderful job of this. You know, episodes of Star Trek are very, very rarely focused on, oh, like if only data could solve this second order partial differential equation, <laughs> then we can figure out how to like, you know, turn the thermocouples into auxiliary power and get the dilithium crystals working again. And then we can go fast and get out of here. Like nice that's not really, <laughs> it's not really how, it, you know, what Star True. Trek is all about. Like someone who's maybe not a fan of Star Trek might say that that's what Star Trek is about, but Star Trek is much more about like, geez, I'm in this difficult situation and these people have a legitimate issue that they have, you know, an injustice and this other competing thing has this other injustice and I'm caught in the middle and none of it is fair to me, but I have to make a decision on what course of action do we take and what outcome are we shooting for? And then when chaos happens, how do we respond to that? And, you know, I think it really makes it clear that your finest hour isn't necessarily about when you do your best work or when you make the best decision. Your finest hour is about when you don't leave anyone behind. And I, I think that's, that's a big important lesson from Star Trek that, that even when someone is flawed, uh, they, 
their life still has value. Definitely. Well, Ethan, this has been a fun discussion and I appreciate you coming on and and having this with me. I've really enjoyed it. I know that you and I have talked about the technology before, so this was a really nice discussion from the softer side. So where can our listeners find you? Oh, sure. So I'm on, uh, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, social media, and, uh, and websites as Starts With a Bang. If you want to find out more about me, uh, check out my website, startswithabang.com, where it has links to everything I'm doing and uh, all about me and what I do as far as astrophysics, science communication, books, videos, and more. And I will have to say, uh, I thoroughly enjoy listening to your podcast. So listeners, you should check it out because there's some great discussions over there about a lot of the hard science and space because who doesn't love space and Star Trek? They go hand in hand. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. This is Haley signing off from the Astrophysics Lab. Thank you for stepping aboard Science Station 2. And thank you to Five Year Mission for the use of their music in this episode. Music for Science Station 2 is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Science Station 2 is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Coconut!